working with chefs, we are a different breed of people. There is no doubt about that. I'm not going <laughs> to pull any punches. Um, you know, and farmers are a different breed as well. I, I think we have a lot of similarities between us. But sh chefs, <coughs> first, first off, we have egos. We have egos. There's no doubt about that. Um, a chef has to have an ego. You know, for them to put out amazing food, they have to have an ego. You know, and they have to, they believe in themselves, but they have to pass that along to their employees. And so this kind of goes along, right? It's not a bad thing. However, as a farmer trying to sell to a chef, you need to understand that, okay? Uh, you need to stroke their ego a little bit. You know, tell them how good they are. Tell them how good their food is, right? If you want to get your product into the restaurant, then you have to do that, okay? Um, <coughs> it's going to go a long way for you. Um, some of the ways, so we talked in the last workshop about how to get into a restaurant. You know, it's really important to kind of look at your, your clientele. You know, it's, it's looking at what they're doing on their menus and maybe giving them some suggestions of how they could use your product. Why is your product going to make their life better? Why is their product going to be profitable for them? Okay, you need to, you need to point that out. Um, what are you doing different than anybody else is doing? You know, chefs, it's, it's highly competitive. You know, the restaurant industry, highly competitive. So how are you going to draw people into your restaurant, you know, rather than going to the guy next door? Well, it's going to be doing the best product, the best possible thing every single day and doing it consistently. It's going to be going, it's going to be having things on your menu that are interesting, that are maybe a little bit different, but at the same time, not scaring people away. You know, I mean, especially in smaller communities, I don't know what the restaurant scene is like here, but I don't imagine it's the, you know, gastronomic mecca. You know, it's just people. <laughs> What is the best restaurant in town? Is there one? Savalas. What kind of food? Okay. Oh, is that right? Hey. Okay. That's cool. Um, is there anything really high-end fine dining? <laughs> I'm curious. Prince George. Prince George. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's going to be a little bit of a challenge then, right? Um, and kind of, you know, because there's only one sort of chef or a couple of chefs in the room, you know, this tells me that what we did down there, so chefs kind of initiated what we did down there, that it's really for this to work up here, it's probably going to have to be the opposite way around. You know, that you guys are going to have to kind of take that step to initiate it and get in, get the chefs interested in this. And so to do that, you're going to have to come up with a really good uh, reason for them to get involved. Because let's face it, your product's more expensive. Your product's a hell of a lot better, but it's more expensive, you know. What's that? Price point is huge. We're pretty cheap town, actually, and for food. Oh, absolutely. It is. You know, it's not just as, as this town. This country as a food culture, in large, we don't pay enough for food. We don't, like it, it's just, pardon me buddy? Yeah. Um, you know, you go to Europe, the, the, the food scene in Europe is completely different than it is here. You know, they're way, way ahead of us. Um, for us, you know, and you look at the wages in the restaurant industry. You know, the average cook's gonna come out of culinary school, they're gonna go and make, you know, maybe anywhere from minimum wage to 12, 14 bucks an hour, maybe. You know, uh, they're going to work all the hours under the sun. They're going to work weekends. They're going to work nights. It's hot. It's sporadic. It's stressful. Why the hell would anybody want to go in to do that, right? Because we love it. That's why. But this is something that, you know, for, for you guys to approach these people, that's, you need to understand that culture, right? And, and appreciate that culture. And, and, you know, what they're going to do with that food. Um, again, you know, we're, we're looking at you know, in smaller places and so on, it's going to be harder for you to get your product into their restaurants. So you need to educate them of why they should do it, how they're going to do it, and how they can do it affordably, right? Um, <clears throat> because local food is more expensive. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. There's not much that we're going to be able to do about it other than educate how we can actually make a profit out of this food, okay? So I think actually this would be a good kind of segue to go into some lamb math. Lamb math, yeah. 
So my good friend David Toms, Chef David Toms, he did this up. Yep. And what this does is it shows you how you can make profit off local protein. Okay? Local protein versus something that's been, you know, <clears throat> mass produced, generally probably about twice the price. Okay? I'm okay with that. I'm 100% okay with that. I would rather pay twice the amount and know what's going into my body is not going to kill me. You know, when I mentioned in the last workshop, <coughs> uh, in this last year alone, I've known five people in my circle that have died of cancer. Five. It's all because of what we're putting in our bodies. Okay? That needs to change. Right? So we need to start making people realize that we need to pay more money for our food. Okay? But... Try and convince a chef of that when he's got a bottom line. When he's got an owner going, hey, I don't care what this stuff comes from, right? I want to make money. You're here to make money. That's what I'm paying you for. You need to do that, okay? So with this lamb, so I've got this whole lamb. It's about 45 pounds, uh, roughly 650 a pound. It's cost me $292 for that whole carcass, okay? So again, this is coming back to uh, a skill set that some chefs are going to have to have, all right? But they don't need to necessarily know how to break down the whole animal. The butcher can do that for them, you know, down into at least primals where they will have the skill to deal with it, okay? But it's being creative about what you're going to do with all those cuts, okay? So when you're making your menus as chefs, you need to leave them a little bit open-ended, leave some flexibility in your menus. So, for example, if I'm going to put lamb on my menu, I'm not going to put lamb rack on my menu because if I'm serving 50 people a night, 60 people a night, and I'm serving out of those people 15, 20 lamb racks a night, well, if it's, say, 20 lamb, that's, <coughs> sorry, 20 lamb racks, that's 10 lamb. <coughs> that's not feasible. Every night I'm going to have to kill 10 lamb just to have lamb racks on my menu? Not, not feasible. You can't do it. Okay? It needs to be a special, huh? Pardon me? It needs to be a special. Well, Yes, so I would have on my menu, lamb of the evening, you know. That way, I'm utilizing the whole animal. I'm doing nose-to-tail cookery, okay. And this is coming back. It's a real resurgence right now. It's the only way that a chef is going to be able to put local protein on their menus, okay. Whether it's lamb, whether it's beef, pork, okay. If they're going to use local, they need to use the whole animal, all right. It's like I said, you know, let's say I'm using beef. If I have New York steak on the menu... Well, there's only two strip loins on a cow. <laughs> I get about 20 steaks out of each strip loin, that's 40 steaks. How many cows do I have to kill in a year <laughs> just to have New York steak on the menu? It's not feasible, okay? But if we get back to using the whole animal, it is, and it's also very profitable, okay? So with this lamb, I buy it for $292. By the time I break it all down and I sell it, I'm gonna make about $1,000 profit. That's a good profit, okay? but I need to be creative with what I'm doing. So, okay, it's just down there on the left, buddy. So, we've got it broken down here. So, this top bit, I like his diagram here. So, this part up here is the neck, okay? So, I'm going to take the neck, I'm going to braise it, I'm then going to take all the meat off it, I'm going to put all that nice, beautiful neck meat, oh, it's, it's so tasty, right? I'm going to put that in a risotto. Okay, with that risotto, I might take, so you've got the legs here, Instead of, you know, lamb shank. So a lot of people put lamb shank on a menu, they serve the whole shank. Yeah, that's great. But what if you'd be a little bit more creative and you take that shank, you slice it up into little medallions about that big, right? Something that, you know, a little lamb ozabuco. So you serve that with your risotto with the lamb neck shaved into it, you know, and maybe, maybe if they're lucky, you give them a lamb chop, like the nice cut, right? Just to kind of tease them. I can sell that dish for 30 bucks. Really? Yeah. Well, 25, 30 bucks, right? That's good profit. That's being creative, right? So, yes, it does take a little bit of a skill set, but really, not that hard to learn those skills, you know? But it's utilizing the whole animal, okay? So, you know, he's broken it down here. Shanks, he's going to get seven servings at $28. It's going to make $196 just off the shanks of the animal going to put the neck meat in risotto, he's going to get about 10 portions, it's 120 bucks. $120 from one lamb neck. That makes sense, right? The ribs, 
He's got 32 portions, he's gonna make about 64 bucks. <coughs> the chops, so we're getting into some more expensive stuff. <coughs> he's gonna get about $126 out of that. The shoulder, eight portions, 112 bucks. The legs, you can break the legs down. There's different uh, sections in the leg. You can make steaks out of them. You can sell those for a really good profit, okay? What this is getting to, and then you know, the trim, the sausage. So everything that's been trimmed off there, you can make sausages, approximately 40 servings per animal, right? Charcuterie, sausage making, it's really coming back these days. You know, you can get good money for this stuff. So again, this is where you guys as the producers need to be going in with a diagram like this and going, hey, that lamb rack that's costing them, you know, 12, 14 bucks to buy, they've got to sell that for 40, 45 bucks on a menu to make any sort of decent profit. You show them this example and go, well, listen, you buy one animal off of me for under 300 bucks and you're going to make over a thousand. That makes good business sense. Yeah. So I'm actually a lamb producer. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> so this is awesome. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and then the 650, so is the 650 kind of standard? Well, that's what, that's that's what he's paying from his producer. Okay. Yeah. And then includes the front and back or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is your first sell at Pat. Do you do a chef or does the, can the chef help? Well, the chef would have, so that would be broken down into primals. Right, so they, he would get um, you know, the shoulder as a primal, so he'd have to deal with it from that point. Okay, so he wouldn't be breaking down the whole lamb. I'm just curious yeah. how much the chef does that. From the primal, uh, that's a pretty n common skill, okay. I would say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I wouldn't want to cook in my kitchen that wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. if he didn't know how, I'd show him. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's lamb math. Like that's just one example. So, if they go to a model like this, our produce, you know, the produce that we buy, if it's organic. It's local, it's probably gonna cost anywhere from 25%, depending on what's in season or what's available, up to 50% more than our insecticide ridden vegetables from 3,000 miles away that taste like crap, right? <laughs> but if I'm using a model like this, I can afford to spend a little bit more on, on my vegetables, okay? Now the other thing is, is that I'm gonna take my cooks to the farm. And this is where you, know, you guys as producers invite them out. Do an event. You know, I think that, that would be my suggestion is you guys as a group, do an event for chefs. Don't make them do any work, okay? Do it on a time when they're quiet. Get them out to your farm. Have some really good beer, okay? Chefs love beer. Have some good wine and put it on an event for them. Have your products there. Showcase your products to them, okay? Sell them on this idea. Say, look guys, this Look how good this tastes. Look how much profit you can make off my lamb. You know, get them to bring their cooks with them. You know, maybe they, maybe they just come by themselves the first time, but then invite them back one at a time. Get them to bring their cooks to the farm. Get them to get their cooks picking your vegetables out of the ground, tasting them, taking them back to their restaurant. You know, like I was talking about in my presentation in the morning. Get them to come out in the morning and get them to cook that stuff and put it on their menu that night. And you tell me that they're not gonna buy in. They will. The other thing that they're gonna do is they're gonna take more care. So yes, it costs a little bit more money to buy it, but they're gonna utilize, if they know where it's coming from, they know how good it tastes and they know the quality of it, they're gonna take care of it, okay? They're not gonna just forget that it's on the stove, right, and boil it away till it's nothing, or it's in the oven and burn it to a crisp, right? They're gonna take care. If they pay more money for it, they're going to take care. They're going to utilize every single bit that they can of that product. You know, with their vegetables, they're going to take the ends. They're going to make stock out of that. You know, they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to make sure that they're getting everything that they can out of that. It's going to have a longer shelf life. Okay, so the stuff that they get from 3,000 miles away, if it's not full of preservatives, of course, <laughs> um, it's going to last longer. It's going to taste better. This is also a marketable item. This is gonna be what gets people into their restaurants, okay? And they need to understand that. So when I write a menu, I make sure that I am mentioning on my menu where I got that stuff from. I'm putting the farm name down on there, right? I'm putting down if it's organic. 
I'm making sure that I'm using that as a marketable item. Okay. Um, I mentioned this in my last workshop that this is what you need to tell chefs. Look, guys, this is what the public wants. It's a growing demand. If you're one of the first to get on board with being the restaurant that's known as, oh, that place, that's all they serve is local stuff, right? They're going to be the pioneer. They're going to be the one that's one step ahead of the guy next door who's getting everything out of a box and out of a freezer, right? That's a marketable item, okay? So they need to, <coughs> that's how you're going to sell them on it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I want to touch on this, so how to work with chefs. Uh, again, this is kind of crossover from the last workshop, but make sure your product is awesome every time. Make sure you're giving them the best that you have. You know, if you've got produce, you're getting potatoes, make sure that they're getting consistent sizing. Make sure that they're clean. Make sure it's convenient for them. Make their life easy, okay? Make sure that if you're delivering stuff, you deliver on time. And if you don't, make sure you're communicating with them, okay? Um, there's nothing more frustrating than thinking your, your delivery is going to come at 10 o'clock, you know? You've planned to have this on your menu at noon for lunch, and it doesn't show up. Or it shows up at noon, you know, when you've got a restaurant full of customers. I would send you away. You may or may not come back to my restaurant again, you know? There's other people out there that will supply it for me. Okay, so you've got to make sure that that quality and that consistency is there. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to use the same examples I used in the last one because this was a particularly frustrating one for me. Um, we had put heirloom tomatoes on our menu last fall. Farmer promised it to us. Yeah, I've got lots, no problem. I can keep you going right through till November. Awesome. So we put this on the menu. Then there was another event that came up and somebody asked for a donation of these heirloom tomatoes and it was a really good event. It was a really good cause. Oh yeah, no problem, here you go, here's my tomatoes. Now I don't get tomatoes anymore, and I'm willing to pay for them, right? Now I have to rewrite my menu, I've got to reprint my menus, right? And that costs me money, right? That, that leaves a really bad taste in the chef's mouth, okay? You gotta be consistent, you gotta be there for them. <laughs> Um, something that needs to happen is, is forming this community and this communication between you guys and the chefs, but also the chefs with the chefs. You know, um, I don't know if there's a chef's association up here, probably not. Um, <coughs> and that may not be necessary, but you know, getting a communication chain out there, getting, getting people talking to each other is so important if you want this movement to succeed. Right? Um, I've learned so much about how other chefs are doing things and how they're making these things work on their menus. You know, um, This is why I'm passing it along to my students. My students are the future purchasers of food. Right? This, this guy here, this is the future. Right? We have to teach our kids about this. Right? But getting back to the chefs, you need to get those guys together. You need to form some sort of communication between, between them so that they know what's going on out there. You know, um, gone are the days where we're you know, hiding all our information. It's, it's to everybody's benefit that we share our information, that we share what we have, and where we're getting stuff from. So connections and networking, that's kind of talking about that. Um, so I, I learned something in the last workshop that doesn't work for you guys up here apparently, is that not everybody up here has internet access. So I guess that is an issue, right? I mean, for us down there, it was very easy to create a listserv, you know, where with one email, I can send that out to everybody, right? Up here, I guess that's not necessarily the case, so there's going to have to be some creative thinking about how that's going to happen so that there can be an effective exchange of information. And that, that's something that we do try and do down there is like encourage the farmers to, you know, yes, that, that farmer is partnered with the chef, but if they run out of something, I think it's a farmer's responsibility to make sure they go out and try and find it. Because, I mean, they know what's being grown around the area, right? So absolutely that's something that should be done. Everybody should be helping everybody out. Yeah, 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 for sure. And it's a, and educating, right? So again, because I'm not seeing many chefs in this room, this is going to be up to you people to go out and educate those guys. You know, like taking this lamb example out there, taking your product out there. Um, you know, like you guys were mentioning last night about where you shipped some of your syrup off to in some of these really high-end places. You know, 
giving that as an example to these people that are on your doorstep and going, look, this is what you can do with this, you know, like your, your plank salmon idea and stuff, right? It doesn't hurt to do that with these guys. You know, show them what can be done. Show them what a unique thing you have here, you know? I think that's the, one of the biggest things is there's so much uniqueness in our area or in our areas, you know, that not necessarily everybody knows about, you know, and that's, that's the special thing. You know, it's not getting a mango from across the world. It's about what we have right here in our doorstep that tastes a million times better than that mango that's been shipped around the world, right? Um, I think that, you know, creating an event like we, we do with Farm to Chefs down there up here, I think would go a long way, you know, because that really is just, it's showcasing everything that you have, right? And it's a really easy, well, it's not easy, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of planning involved, but it's a really good, effective way to show the public what you've got. And that's the other part. It's educating the public. You know, I talked about earlier this morning. That's our responsibility. Farmers and chefs, we're going to change the way that people eat. You know, so, yeah. Uh, cooperative growing. <coughs> I, I think that's a very important point, you know, um, if, because you're not necessarily going to have that capacity. Um, part of what I talked about in my last workshop was that wouldn't it be fantastic if all the farmers got together and one said, you know what, I've admitted, I have the best carrots. So at the farmer's market, rather than having 10 stalls that everybody's selling carrots and they're all competing against each other, go, well, let's get the person who grows the best ones and they can focus on that. Then this person who's got this land that grows amazing beets, okay, perfect, so let them do that, you know. I mean, I know this is pretty big kind of, you know, out there, but wouldn't that be a fantastic way to operate, that if everybody started talking to each other and going, you know what, I've got the best cattle. So maybe this guy over here has got great cattle too, well, can we work together somehow? Or I've got the best sheep, you know? So there's an, there you go, right? <laughs> but, you're, you know, we're talking about capacity. So wouldn't it be an, an ideal thing? And this is where, you know, as chefs, we've always talked about with our, our collaborative is that if we buy it, they'll grow it. So the chefs need to kind of help with building that capacity. You know, to, 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 to say to you guys, all right, look, you know, like we, what we've done with our retail meat program, we've gotten to the point where he can say, okay, Ian, I'm going to buy 50 cattle off you, start growing them. So next year, that 50 cattle is ready for him, right? And that's the kind of capacity building that has to happen is the communication between everybody that if, you know, the chefs are going, okay, yeah, I will buy 50 pounds of carrots off you this year. Okay, cool. I'll grow 50 pounds of carrots for you, right? And that's the other thing too, is talking to the chefs about doing unique things for them, specifically for their restaurant. You know, like let's say you have this, you know, an amazing variety of carrot that nobody's ever seen before and it's the best frickin' tasting carrot that you've ever had. You take that in and go to the chef and go, here, listen, what do you think? I'll grow this exclusively for you, right? That's all things that they can market on their menu. Uh, winter market products. Um, I talked, in my last workshop about uh, cellaring, so root cellars. So as chefs, this takes forward planning, but if you can forward plan with your farmer, say, listen, grow me all these root vegetables. I know this is approximately how many pounds I'm gonna use over the winter time. Cellar them for me. I'll buy them off you. Um, so <coughs> a couple of years ago, we did a dinner. Uh, it was a, a gala dinner that we do, a fundraising dinner. And the theme was BC. They told me a year in advance, and so I went to my farmer and I said, hey, look, what can you give me in February? She goes, you can have whatever you want, root cellar wise. All these root vegetables, you tell me what you want. It was for 320 people. I'll put them in the cellar for you. And so in February, she pulled them out of the cellar. They're primo, perfect quality. And I got to get up there in front of 320 people and say, hey guys, guess what? Everything on your plate is local. It's February in Kamloops and I'm serving you local vegetables, right? But it takes forward planning, right? And that's where you need to educate the chefs Listen, guys, we can do this for you, but you got to let me know a little bit in advance, right? Imagine what a marketable thing that would be for a restaurant in town to go, you're going to come in my restaurant in December and I'm going to have fresh local vegetables for you. So what are chefs looking for? I mean, it depends, obviously, but, you know, again, it's, they're looking for stuff that's great quality, that's unique, stuff they can put on their menus that's going to draw people into their restaurants, 